Hello and welcome to Behind the News. My name is Doug Henwood. The usual two guests today, first and seconds, we'll hear from Ann Newman, author of The Good Death. And then around the bottom of the hour, we'll talk with Richard Florida, the theorist most famous for analyzing the role of the so-called creative class in urban life. First, Ann Newman, author of The Good Death, An Exploration of Dying in America, published in February by Beacon Press. As you'll hear, she developed a professional interest in how we treat the end of life as a society when her father died. Never a happy affair, we make death structurally even more difficult than it has to be. My parents died over the last several years, my father in 2010, my mother in 2013. It was rough going at times, and what Ann Newman writes about really spoke to me. It's not easy stuff to think about, but she does it with intelligence and grace. Ann Newman. I have to be honest, this is a topic that makes me anxious. Uh, I'm sure I'm not alone in this. Process questions. How did you get interested in the topic? And did you approach it with any of the same anxieties that many of the rest of us did? Well, thanks for having me. Um, I think I probably would have if I hadn't gone through it with my father, which is the experience that initiated this whole project. So in um, uh, 2005, my father died of non-Hodgkin lymphoma at the age of 60, and I think we had all been under the impression that it was going to be a very different experience than it was. We were kind of working off our cinematic knowledge of what dying was like, and we got hospice into the house, and we thought that we would tuck him into bed and make our peace and, and um, tell each other we loved each other, and then he'd close his eyes, and that would be that. And it was something altogether different. Um, he had what's called terminal restlessness, so he was combative. Um, at one point, he was no longer mentally competent and stopped talking to us because he realized that he was no longer mentally competent. And to watch this person that I had known in such an intimate way to go through this physical and mental and emotional um, experience was really traumatic. And I was, to be honest, I was pissed off. And I sat with it for about a year and a half. And then I realized that... Who or what was the object of your anger? Um, I wasn't sure. I was just angry that I didn't know. Well, it was my family. It was the hospice women. It was the doctors for not better preparing me. My society for not giving me a more accurate understanding of how death could happen. And so I started by becoming a hospice volunteer, and then I started writing about it for a number of different publications, and I realized, oh, I've got a larger project here than, than I thought, and, and so the book. Before you did that, though, you went on that around-the-world trip, right? Uh, yeah, yeah, I left the country. I was like, my head is messed up. Grief is a journey. I'm going to just follow the metaphor. And I kind of threw myself around the world, primarily in developing countries, so I was living in holes for, you know, like a year and a half, and I had a lot of strange experiences. And I thought that that would be a way for me to avoid the grief of my dad's death, but when I came back, it was all right there. You know, of course, you can't run away from it. Yeah, well, my father died, what, five and a half years ago, almost six years. Uh, and uh, I recall the, the for many months afterwards, like, the, the real emotional roller coaster of uh, anger, mourning, uh, fear, you know, mm -hmm. midnight awakening, yeah. all kinds of things like that. Yeah, it all not, stacks up. Yeah, I'm not sure whether I could have escaped that by traveling around the world or not. Oh, I didn't. I was really fooling myself. I was kind of a mess. Um, and I came across a lot of situations that weren't really good for me. But it, but it was not just dad's death. It was kind of my grandfather died and then my grandmother died and then my cousin who was 38, only two years older than I was at the time, died two weeks before my dad. And then it was my dad. Oh, and the dog died in there, I swear to God. And so it was just this deluge of grief and absence and funerals. And it was too much all at once. So then you went to volunteer in hospices. Mm. Why? I wanted to know if his death had been a good death. I wanted to know if there was anything else that we could have done. I wanted to know if that was actually how it occurred, because we did everything right. He had been diagnosed for 10 years, so we had plenty of time for him to get his finances together, to even put a bathroom in the downstairs so he wouldn't have to go up steps. I mean, we and he made all sorts of arrangements to prepare for it, and yet this experience was, was what it was. And so I wanted to know what other deaths were like. I wanted a comparison. What was the result of your research? What have you found? Mm. 
well, I think I, I say it in the book, if I can quote myself, there's no such thing as a good death. There's a good enough death, and that's about as close as we can get. But in the country at the moment, we're a long way from that. We have a lot to do. There are so many factors that inhibit people actually doing what they want or dying pain-free or getting the care that they need that um, we have a lot yet to do. You, know, you write about how the medical system is really set up to prolong life mm. and alleviate pain and cure, mm -hmm. but it's really not very good at dealing with death, right? No, not at all. And I think um, this is kind of an artifact of, of a prior era. At one point, we thought we were going to cure cancer and mortality and all of these things and go to the moon and the Jetsons. And, and medicine got into this push to continue innovation. Uh, and when 911 lines became prevalent and ambulances could get to people in their homes very quickly, um, and we developed code blue and defibrillators that could restart the heart, all of this emergency resuscitation um, took over our imaginations and kind of blinded us to their possibilities. If doctors perform CPR on an elder, the chance that their ribs will be broken is you know, really high. And so we fooled ourselves into thinking that we could just prop up human bodies forever, and we can't. But I do think that, um, and I do a little bit of this history in the book, where if you look back at prior generations, doctors could only do so much. You know, they had maybe opium in a bottle and... Therapeutic nihilism. <laughs> exactly. And when it came to pain cessation or even the actual dying process, they called in the pastor or the priest. And that was their answer to end-of-life care. And so I think all of these things have contributed to the medical community not looking at the dying process in a clear light. Palliative medicine has only been a specialty recognized by the American Medical Association for 10 years. Doctors aren't taught how to treat pain. They're not taught how to give terminal diagnoses. So the medical community has really turned away from this aspect of healthcare and I think in small ways is now coming around. Well, my mother was dying in uh, a, uh, a nursing home. She'd been in the nursing home, had Alzheimer's. She was like, just completely out of it for seven or so years. She was in the nursing home for 10 years. And then she contracted the pneumonia that would finally kill her in a few days. And I went to see her and the head nurse there asked me if I wanted to take her to the emergency room. You know, and we had signed, do not treat, do not resuscitate orders. It was very clear. We'd spoken to them many times. Our intentions were thoroughly clear, but they still have that instinct. Yes, and I see this and hear about it all the time. I have a friend just a few weeks ago. The hospice basically revolted against the family's wishes and said, this woman has dementia. She can't eat anymore. She doesn't want to eat, but we're going to syringe nutrition into her mouth. And the family said, hands down, no. And the daughter is the president of a theological seminary, but they challenged her on her ethics and accused her of wanting to kill her mother. And it was a hideous experience. It really traumatized her. But that experience of what you're saying all the time happens. Well, and also in the last few years of her life, she was becoming very difficult to feed. She clamped her mouth shut when they tried to feed her. And uh, they would basically force feed her. Yes. They just forced the spoon into her mouth. And I took it up with the director of the nursing home and he said there was nothing they could do. But now you write about people who are still very conscious and capable of making their own decisions, refusing to eat. But there's a acronym for that, which I can't remember now. Yeah, it's VSED, Volu Voluntary Stopping Eating and Drinking. In the states where there's a, a huge push to legalize aid in dying, but it's not yet legal, particularly dementia um, and Alzheimer's patients are uh, employing this method. You know, I spoke with a lawyer who said that he couldn't do anything to the, with the nursing home. Mm. They're just so... Um, eager to, to keep people alive. Who knows what her intentions were or whether she had any intentions. You could conclude that she was really trying to stop eating and drinking and just end it. I'm so sorry, Doug. That's a terrible thing to watch. I hear stories about it all the time. I see it all the time. And I think it's a particular culture. This is not an innate need to push food into the mouth of someone, uh, mouths of people who are in pain who are terminal. It's a culture within our healthcare system, within our nursing homes. Well, my father was dying. I used to take him to Brooklyn Hospital for just little interventions, nothing major, because he didn't want to do anything major at that point. And he would say, I, you know, they'd ask him how he was. The doctors and the nurses would say, how are you? And he'd say, I just want to die. Mm. And they just 
were shocked and said, what are you talking about? What are you talking about? And why? And he said, well, you know, I'm 93 years old. I'm falling apart. Why do I want to keep on? But they just would not listen, whether it's, you know, an aide or, you know, a doctor. At every level of this, this machinery, they want to keep you going. Mm -hmm. Now, you write about, uh, what do we call it, assisted suicide, mm -hmm. um, euthanasia. Mm -hmm. The names themselves are political, right? Quite. What are the, uh, the politics behind the naming of this procedure? Assisted suicide is still tainted by that suicide word for many, um, and the proponents of aid in dying feel very strongly that it's not suicide. If you're already terminal, if you've got only a few weeks or months to live, you're not actually trying to kill yourself or take yourself out. You do not want to be in pain anymore, or you do not want to be in that decline anymore. But you'll hear assisted suicide all the time from opponents of legalization because it has a power to it, that suicide word. In Europe, euthanasia... And then being an assisted makes it sound like you're an accomplice to murder. Exactly. Well, also, if you look at state statutes, you'll find a number of assisted suicide laws throughout the country that were passed with the intention of, say, you giving a gun to a suicidal friend, assisting their suicide but that are being used to prevent legalization of aid and dying. So the name of the statute is, uh, is what many people are employing this term for as well. So what, what's the legal status? What, three states where it's legal now? Five. Five. Yeah, so Oregon is 94, Washington 2008. And then it was Montana via court case. So Oregon and Washington, we thought were anomalies, right, the Northwest. And they passed them by ballot initiative, voter approval. The case in Montana. Both, by the way, very secular states. They're among the most secular states in the country. And incredibly white yeah. and, and secular, yes. And then Montana did it in 2010, but that was a Supreme Court decision, a state Supreme Court. Um, and that's a state that has lots and lots of guns and a very strong libertarian focus. And then Vermont passed it via the legislature, which was the first time that occurred. Um, and then in December, we just saw California, which brought 40 million more people into an environment where aid and dying is legal. Now, my father had me research uh, Oregon because he mm -hmm. was look looking to end it that way. He was looking for some help. It's pretty tightly controlled, right? You just can't fly into Portland and decide you want to end it all, right? No, in fact, um, proponents who are looking at 18 years of data coming out of Oregon are saying it's too restricted. As it exists now, you have to request aid in dying. Basically, you have to request a lethal dose of medication, a prescription for a lethal dose of medication from your doctor. You have to do it in writing, and you have to wait, and then you can do it uh, verbally. You have to have six months or less to live. If there's any question about that terminal diagnosis, you need a, a second opinion. If there's any question about your mental competence, you have to have a psychiatrist. Um, and then um, you've got to have the means to pay for the drug, which can be anywhere from 400 to $1,200. And then you have to uh, be able to pick up the prescription. You can keep it in your home and never take it if that's your desire. You're not required to take it, of course. But the fear is that many patients lose mental or physical competence. And you know from your experience with your parents how ability can fluctuate. One day could be great, um, especially for, say, demented patients or Alzheimer's patients or patients with neuromuscular diseases. So you don't really know when your last good day is going to be. So the question of when can I take this medication is a real, is a real one for many. I'm Sugath Ann Newman, author of uh, The Good Death uh, from Beacon, and the opposition to uh, assisted suicide or aid in dying, or whatever we call it, a lot of that comes from the religious community, right? Yeah, absolutely. For the most part, it's the, the Catholic Church or allied evangelicals who are saying from their quote-unquote pro-life platform, the whole garment is no abortion, no stem cell research, no euthanasia, no on and on. For a long time, euthanasia term has been thrown in there. Um, the Catholic Church has been staunchly opposed to it. They have a vested interest as well. Um, their soft power is just influence over uh, U.S. politics, um, their ability to mobilize their grassroots organizations, being the churches. Um, but their hard power is 
the operation of one in six hospital beds in the country. So if you think about the number of Catholic hospitals that are not required to abide by general medical practice because of religious exemptions, that can decide what patients will and will not be informed of based on Catholic doctrine, then the church has a huge vested interest in um, the way that this issue is playing out. And they're not happy at the moment with the momentum that the movement has. It's not an uncommon practice for doctors with a wink and a nod to give you a little extra push of morphine to ease your way out, right? I mean, this is a practice that's not unheard of. We just don't talk about it very openly. Right, and in some ways we might be able to liken it to abortion in the early, early 70s or, or late 60s, where some doctors did not disapprove and did what they had to for their female patients. I would love to do the research into the number of United States doctors or United States presidents who actually went out on a hefty dose of morphine. It's called the double effect in the medical world, and it's a term that comes from Aquinas, uh, St. Thomas Aquinas. And the double effect means that if your intention is to alleviate pain, but the action inadvertently causes a person's death, so be it. Your intention is still good. And um, this term comes up quite a bit in the arguments to legalize aid and dying because lawyers are saying, wait a minute, what's the difference? If we all know that a little too much morphine is going to stop this patient's breathing, this patient's dying anyway, what's the difference? The disability rights lobby is not far, very fond of aid and dying, right? You, you, you've got some pretty harsh opposition when you're first writing about this material from uh, one particularly truculent fellow, right? Yeah, I got slapped down by a disability rights activist named Bad Cripple or Bill Peace. He's got this amazing, angry website called Bad Cripple. That's the name he uses when blogging, and he's a pretty prolific blogger. He's also an anthropologist with a PhD, and he's up in Syracuse these days. But I started saying, why does this one organization, this dis disability rights organization, so strongly oppose aid and dying? or as they would call it, assisted suicide. Because my assumption would, was that disability rights community would be all about medical autonomy for themselves. And my question was, why does their language sound so much like the religious right or other opponents of aid and dying legislation? And when I posed that question online, I was pounced on by a number of uh, the not dead yet activists and, and adherents. And so Bill and I got into an online shouting match where I admitted that I didn't have a handle on disability issues as, as pertaining to aid and dying. And finally, he emailed me privately and said, I bet we agree on more than you think. Come on up for lunch. And I drove up to Port Jervis, where he was living at the time, and we struck up this friendship. And we continued to disagree on quite a few things, but he became a friend, and I learned a lot about um, his position on aid and dying opposition. But since the manuscript for the book was turned in, there's been a fascinating development in disability rights activism against aid and dying. The longtime legal counsel for Compassion and Choices, largest proponent of legalization in the country. Which traces back to Humphrey and the uh, Humboldt. Yeah, they don't like to talk about it. In fact, they won't touch my book because they don't like that history brought up. They, they don't want Hemlock Society anywhere next to their name. Um, there are also a couple things that I do in the book that bother them about drugs and costs and comparisons. But uh, she, Catherine Tucker, legal counsel, um, who's behind almost every successful effort uh, in the country, left Compassion and Choices. I just saw her a couple weeks ago, and she's a little vague on the reasons why. But she became the executive director of the Disability Rights Legal Council, which is a legal center, which is based in Los Angeles, and almost immediately brought a case against the state of New York saying that aid and dying should be legal here. So she shifted the lens on aid and dying so fascinatingly, so strategically. It's, it's been interesting to watch the disability rights community, which has never been you know, monolithic like any community, but uh, which was most vocal around opposition. The most active ones are very vocal, and I, I, mm -hmm. as far as I understand their reasoning, it's that you know society wants to cut costs, right. and you know, also very much prejudiced in favor of youth and health would just mm -hmm. browbeat uh, people into uh, voluntary 
<laughs> right. Voluntary suicide. Well, you know, if I were sitting in Bill Peace's wheelchair um, and had some of the experiences that he has, I may feel the same way. That's not to say that he's right. Um, I think, again, if you look at the stats out of Oregon, we have 18 years with no proof that these laws have caused us to go after the quote unquote most vulnerable. I don't think that there is um, now a push in states where aid and dying is legal to take out the disabled, to take out the elderly and the frail. In fact, we've got you know larger problems like futile care where we're over treating people to the point of pain and discomfort. You know, I used to think when I was sitting in the, the day room at my mother's nursing home that you know, there's a room full of people there who were costing Medicaid a million dollars a year. Mm -hmm. And at the same time in a society where kids are not getting basic health care. Right. And it just like, strikes you. It's just really the proper allocation of resources, prolonging life to such a degree yeah. at uh, the, the cost of not covering other people. Yeah, that's why the rationing conversation regarding health care is just is such a ruse because we already ration health care, right? We've still got 30 million Americans, at least that we can count, who don't have health care. We still have how many homeless? I was just on the West Coast and I was appalled by how visible and numerous the homeless population is there um, from city to city, Portland to LA. There are so many things that we do wrong with health care. How many people are paying for Obamacare and just not using it because it's too much of a hassle, or they can't get a doctor's appointment, or they don't have a relationship with the doctor anymore? Or you got so, 6,000 deductible and copay. Exactly, exactly. So, I mean, the way that we do health care right now is completely ludicrous. It is rationed according to class and race. And until we acknowledge that, that we already have a rationing problem. How are we even going to address the, the, the crazy expense that we put out to, according to some patients, torture them? Finally, I'm curious, how did this book change you? Did it uh, change you, make you a different person? Do you think of death differently now? I've found that I still, in my daily life, in my day-to-day -day activities, I'm, I'm probably very much the same person I was before I started it, but when faced with large tragedies or traumatic experiences, I've gotten really calm. Like I can, oh, hold still, I can handle this. I think there's something about seeing so many people die, being in the room, feeling the last pulse, and having long-term relationships with these people has changed the way that I experience great anxiety or trauma. I think it's also made me reprioritize things. There are a lot of things that I just don't worry about anymore, that I have let go, that in the past, prior to all this research, I held very closely. I don't care what people think about me in the same way, things as small as that. So the book has changed me. And I think also I had to go out on a limb here. There's not a lot of, there aren't a lot of people that are doing this kind of work. And I had to think for myself against a lot of studies. And that was fear inducing, but also emboldening. Do you feel any different about your own mortality? Yeah, I'm not afraid. Um, and I also know exactly the way <laughs> I want things to go down depending on the situation. My whole family knows. Everyone uh, knows where my living will is. Everyone knows who my lawyer is and where his number is. And um, I know that um, I want it to take place in a particular way. That was Ann Newman, author of The Good Death, An Exploration of Dying in America, published in February by Beacon Press. You're listening to KPFA and KPFB in Berkeley, KFCF in Fresno, on the web to kpfa.org. My name is Doug Henwood, and the program is Behind the News.
Oh, some of the first movement of Beethoven's String Quartet No. 14, performed by the Yale String Quartet. Next, Richard Florida. He's an urban theorist based at the University of Toronto, where he's director of cities at the Martin Prosperity Institute at the university's Rotman School of Management. Florida is most famous for developing the theory that a creative class of knowledge workers is responsible for the dynamism of our most successful cities. He's been sharply criticized for this point of view, for its alleged elitism, among other things, and problematic empirical grounding. I'll bracket that for now, though I'd like to come back to it soon. Richard Florida. Living here in, you know, the, uh, the creative twee uh, corner of Brooklyn that I do, you know, certain things are on my mind. And uh, one is the incredible boom in real estate values that have gone on. I moved here in 2008, and property values have roughly doubled in this neighborhood, Clinton Hill. How common is this across North America? Is, is Brooklyn one of those islands of uh, boomy prosperity that uh, is at odds with what's going on in the rest of North America? How, what's the, the rest of the urban landscape look like? Well, I think Brooklyn is an extreme outlier in both boomy prosperity and, and as you know, better than me, sort of increasingly difficult inequality in housing affordability. And I think, I think the reason for that you know, to think about this from from kind of an institutional or Schumpeterian or even Marxian point of view, is that the landscape for capital accumulation or for economic growth, innovation, whatever word you want to use, has become increasingly uneven. And that one of the things many great economists, whether whether they're Schumpeter or Marx, sort of forgot about, but the classical economists talked a lot about land. It's not just that land creates value by being fertile soil or perhaps having access to a port or a feature of geography, but because people and economic assets cluster on land. And as Jane Jacobs you know, was wont to remind us, it is that clustering of people and human activity on land that, that is the real source of innovation, not just big industrial firms, but this clustering of human talent so then we get this incredibly uneven landscape where in New York City, but pr primarily Manhattan and, and adjacent parts of Brooklyn, because there are much lower land prices and housing prices in outlying parts of Brooklyn, um, in the San Francisco Bay Area, in London, and I could go on, but it's, it's not an infinite list of places. In fact, it's probably roughly 20 or two dozen places around the world and perhaps a dozen or so places in the United States which are seeing this extreme clustering of people in economic activity and this incredible surge in housing prices. Um, and the rest are either stable or appreciating slightly or more traumatically and tragically for many. Um, for every Brooklyn, you know, there is a place that's kind of falling apart and seeing its property values and housing prices decline. So I guess my, my biggest sense of this is that our world is increasingly geographically uneven and spiky. Economic activity and innovation are clustered in some places rather than others. And even within metro regions, like the New York metro region or San Francisco, which are big winners, there's a high degree of unevenness. And, and, and I, the way I like to think of it is we're getting these spikes of very concentrated advantage adjacent to much larger territories of concentrated disadvantage as, as the middle falls out of our economy. Well, this sounds like a geographical expression of uh, what Thomas Piketty wrote about. I think, I think so. And, you know, there's this great young person at MIT. Um, I can't probably pronounce his name right. His name is Ruginelli or Rugnelli or Rognile. He actually did, and, and I'm quite sympathetic with Piketty's work. I think it's, it's very it's terrific. And many economists, you know, when a work gets popular, go at it. But this, this young man, who was a graduate student, provided a very sympathetic critique. And he said, if you look at real wealth accumulation is coming from and the returns to capital, it's not coming from capital in the abstract. A humongous share of it is coming from capital in the form of land. And that this ability to acquire and hold land in these spiky areas is a big part of the wealth inequality we're seeing. So I think it is right, you know, and Felix Salmon had this great tweet one day that I'll never forget. Um, the land prices and property prices that we see in Brooklyn, Manhattan, San Francisco, London, are the physical and geographic manifestation of R greater than G. And, and I think that's exactly, exactly what is happening, is that the concentration of economic assets and human assets, talent, if you will, advantage classes on land is reinforcing, reflecting, perpetuating, and exacerbating 
the kind of wealth inequality we see. And I was, I was just reading a tweet today um, where they were talking about the affordability threshold in New York and how hard it is for young people to get out of their parents' basements. And, and what I wrote back, because you know, both, both of us are avid tweeters, uh, I think that's how we re reestablished our, our colleagueship. Um, I tweeted back, unless you have the bank of mom and dad. And I think what's happening now is class-based advantage and local locational advantage is being reinforced, not just reinforced, not just by the schools you have access to or the university you can get accepted to, but it's literally which city mom and dad can help you buy access to. And, you know, I teach MBA students at the University of Toronto. And more and more of them are fascinated by urbanism and urban development and real estate. And less and less of them are fascinated by finance and consultancy, uh, which is a reality, a reflection of our times. And, and I asked them, how many of you, very advantaged people, MBA students, think you can afford, afford a house in Toronto, which is not Brooklyn, which is not Manhattan, which is not London? They said, well, none of us, unless we have access to the bank of mom and dad. So I think, I think this locational advantage compounds class-based advantage and reinforces wealth, enduring wealth uh, inequality. Well, I visit Toronto uh, fairly often, and uh, it just seems like it's a booming, a boom town to me. Uh, I see construction all over the place, uh, but it's not really reached that top tier of North American cities. No, I think, I mean, I mean, in Toronto, I really like it. You know, I moved there with all these romantic kind of, I'm saying these with small letters, because some of my critics would say they don't fit me, progressive, left-leaning, urbanistic notions. And of course, you know, I show up there and within a couple of years, the late Rob Ford was elected mayor, shattering, you know, bursting my bubble. And I think a lot of my growth, intellectual growth as an urbanist, actually came from, from seeing a very progressive small p, very open-minded, very diverse, you know, with a strong, certainly by U.S. standards, a strong social welfare state, seeing, you know, a group of working people, new immigrants, elect this horrific, you know, who I thought was just, just the worst, the most anti-urban mayor I had ever seen. So I think Toronto also reflects this very concentrated pattern of urban advantage, uh, advantageness surrounded, you know, there's this wonderful professor at the University of Top Toronto, David Holchansky, that everyone should read his works, who did this remarkable piece of research, um, which looked at what he called the three cities of Toronto. And, and this will resonate with you who studied labor. The declining middle city, which was the old working class neighborhoods, analogous to the working class neighborhood in New Jersey, where my father, my, fa my factory worker father, bought a home and we grew up. Uh, that had declined stupendously and in its place surged, create, were created two new Torontos. A very advantaged Toronto clustered around the downtown core, the central business district, the university, and of course the transit lines. And the, which had grown somewhat, and an even larger third Toronto, if you will, a much more vast area of economic disadvantage away from the downtown, pushed farther into the periphery and away from the subway line. So I think as Toronto has boomed, it's kind of, I look at its economy as kind of a mini New York. You know, it's a national economic financial media center. It's kind of a mini London. As it has boomed, some people have done well, but many more have, have faltered. And even in a place that by all U.S. standards would be deemed progressive, we got a kind of Trumpistic backlash that elected Rob Ford. And, uh, fortunately, we have a new mayor who's kind of a corporate mayor, a decent guy, a meritocratic guy, but, but certainly far better than, than what was there before him. You, of course, have got famous for the, the concept of the creative class, and that's one of the things that uh, you know, gives uh, places like New York, San Francisco, uh, its, uh, its dynamism, uh, their alarm. But will that creative class be priced out by these real estate booms and you know, um, smash the, the, you know, the, the golden egg? That's an excellent question. In fact, my new book, which is they, they, it's done, but they wanted to postpone its release until after the uh, I don't know, we call it ridiculous election, the fiasco of an election we have with Trump and all of this, uh, because the publisher said, you know, no one pays attention to anything else but election. I'm going to deal with that. But let me reflect on a minute. Um, my concept of the creative class really came from kind of my lifelong interest in trying to update Marx for the 21st century. I actually wrote a paper on this in graduate school and, and got an award and got to meet Paul Sweezy, one of my absolute idols. Uh, where I said you could look at the labor structure, and I called it a social framework for accumulation, and look at the class position, not of workers versus capitalists, but of what Marxists at that time called strata within the working class. 
And I was very influenced by Eric Olin Wright and others who were looking at this professional middle strata. I was writing about knowledge workers, tech workers, think workers, all of this. And uh, when I began to write what became Rise of the Creative Class, a very brilliant editor named Bill Frucht, who's now, he was at Basic Books, now at Yale University Press, said, Richard, if you look at your data, you are talking about a new class of people. They're not just knowledge workers, they include artists. Why don't you call it a class? I resisted and ultimately I came around to Bill's way of thinking. But the creative class, to my mind, are people who, who to my mind, are people whose knowledge, whose intelligence and creativity have become the means of production. They are about a third of the workforce in the United States, quite a bit bigger than the working class, which is about a fifth, and quite a bit bigger than the direct factory workers, who are about 6% of the workforce. So I, I dub them that, uh, and, and believe that they are part of a new framework of understanding class. Here's the rub. When you look at who can afford to live in big cities, and we did an analysis that my great friend and sometimes sparring partner, Joel Kotkin, said I abandoned my theory. With some colleagues, we actually looked at who could afford to live in these superstar regions after paying for housing. And it ends up the creative class, even the artists, can still afford, you know, maybe they can't live in Soho anymore or Tribeca, but they can certainly come out to Brooklyn or Jersey City or Hoboken, where my brother used to live. The artists who can combine income, can freelance, can do a bunch of things, the musicians who tend to have some other skills can get by. It's the working and service people, you know, the... the Nearly 50% of us who do low-wage precarious service work would get screwed. In my new book, I take a very close look at this. And, and what I find is, paradoxically, the creative classes of San Francisco, New York, and Los Angeles are getting somewhat stronger in the short term because they're adding the techies. You know, the techies are now streaming back to London, streaming back to New York. The question is, can this continue? And I, I'm guessing at some point a threshold is reached where the creative quotients of these cities would be undermined. But it seems to me that the creative class as a whole is still doing pretty darn well. It's the working and serve, particularly the service class, this under-analyzed, under-thought about, under-theorized service class that's really getting knocked around and getting pushed to the peripheries and pushed out. And I think, you know, there was this great Chetty study, which I'm sure you saw, we tweeted about, which talked about, you know, if you're a poor or disadvantaged person in, in terms of your health you're better off living in a San Francisco or New York or Boston or D.C. for a whole variety of reasons I don't need to get into. What really scares me is that those people are precisely the people who are getting pushed out, that a, a working family like my own family, born in, I'm born in Newark, moved to North Arlington, a working class suburb. It would be very difficult now, you know, for a working family to afford that. So my, my real worry is that the working and service class people are being pushed further and further away from the most functional, healthy mobility spurring parts of our economy and and this economic class-based differential is being baked into our geography so I'm, I'm less worried about the creative class i'm more worried about the other classes well then the creative class gets very large if you're talking about techies who can earn a good living versus you know people who are editors and artists and things like that who are barely getting by unless they have the bank of mom and dad behind them yeah i've been criticized for this and, and by very smart people like ann marcus and who i admire and others um, a group of scholars, though, who actually looked at the BLS data on occupational skill, actually looked at my definition and said that when it comes to the way in which workers relate to, I'll use the means of production, they would use technology, a less loaded term. The creative class actually makes sense as a coherent category. And, and going back to labor theory, I actually kind of look at this, and Doug, I'd like your unfiltered comments on this because I think it's important how we advance science uh, and our understanding of labor markets and places. I kind of look at it as analogous to the old labor aristocracy, that there were these skilled trades, you know, the people who were in the AFL who commanded much higher work wages than the unskilled trades people, like, like my own dad, who worked in the mass production, industrial steel mills, and then ultimately the assembly facilities. And we had a primary labor market, you know, for, for manufacturer workers and a secondary labor market, a kind of dual labor market, a la Michael Peoria and others. I kind of think the creative class is the same thing. It's a coherent class based on its relationship to knowledge and the means of production. But it, there's quite a great degree of differentiation and variation within it. That said, even when we look at the low end extremes of the creative class, a creative class person is doing far, far, far better than someone toiling in a food prep, food service, retail trade, you know, personal home health aid kind of jobs, which are unfortunately the lowest paying and highest, uh, fastest growing cate job categories of our economy. 
Uh, you argue that uh, one way to make our cities more affordable is to increase density. Uh, and you know, I'm sitting here about a mile, mile and a half from what is now being called the Brooklyn Creative District, uh, Brooklyn, uh-huh. <laughs> Brooklyn Cultural District, sorry, uh, around the Brooklyn Academy of Music on the border between downtown and Fort Greene. And skyscrapers are popping up there like crazy. And to people walking around, this just looks like the onslaught of gentrification that's going to price them out. They see it as quite the opposite of making things more affordable. What's your argument there? And they are absolutely right. So I've tried to take an urban planner, you know, I'm a, a Jane Jacobs advocate and trained as an urban planner, not as an economist. What I think happened, to be quite candid, is a group of urban economists, let's call them market-based urbanists. These are people who really believe in very simple ideas. They're, they're, not, they're important ideas, but they're very simple. So the, in, in a previous life, the very same people who were arguing the key to economic growth was the favoring of sun, skills, and sprawl have now turned about on a dime and said the solution to all our urban problems is massing density, building tall towers and skyscrapers. And of course, the important coda on this, because it always is, Doug, you you know this as well as I do, get rid of regulation. If we just trash all the land use and zoning codes, you know, that keep incinerators out of your neighborhood and keep all these noxious, we just get rid of that stuff and we let developers go wild our cities will be safe. What I've said is we want to add Jane Jacobs density. We know that the kinds of neighborhoods human beings love that are highly innovative are just the kind of neighborhoods, I'm assuming from what you said, you live in. It's not single family sprawl and it's not Singapore and Hong Kong towers. It's four and five and maybe you go to six or 10 or 12 stories, but it's a vibrant street life. It's public spaces, third places where people congregate. And the key is not massing. I I talk about vertical sprawl. It's not massive power blocks. Those where people stay inside. It's this kind of active, engaged street life, which actually, you know, if you talk to political theorists, is part of the reason we get democratic politics and all sorts of political debate. And we get activist politics. It, It comes out of this ability for people to clash and clamor. The same thing that brings innovation brings democratic politics. So I've been very much trying to make a nuanced argument, but I think you're absolutely right. What comes out the other end is we need more density, get rid of all the land use restrictions and zoning codes. And you know what that ends up with? You see it in New York, more rich people housing. (laughs) You know, at the end of the day, you get more billionaire housing and more and more, and, and and they deaden the streetscape because no one lives there and their lights out. So we need a new approach to density, which is neither vertical sprawl nor horizontal sprawl, which is getting back to what we've always known, that the kinds of neighborhoods that really work are the kinds of neighborhoods that actually you and I live in. We have the great good fortune to live in, both of us. It's funny the way uh, arts and culture are used uh, now as the lubricants of gentrification. I mean, this has been going on since, you know, Soho happened 40 years ago, but uh, now there seems to be a whole playbook about doing it that way. And so we have around that Brooklyn Cultural District, you you have the culture being like the advance guard of this upscaling, and then then culture gets priced out and you have a bunch of rich people in, in soulless towers. Is there an alternative to this? Well, Jane Jacobs, you know, I asked her this question when she was still living, and I went to visit her in her house in the annex in Toronto, and I said the same thing about Soho. This was maybe not quite 20 years ago, but yeah, it might have been 20 years ago. And I said, what about Soho? And this was before the crash and the boom and all of this and the hotels and the the fancy schmancy shops. And she said, you know, Richard, when a place gets boring, even the rich people leave. And what's happened, if you look at many of these districts that were expensive districts, got, the rich people moved in there and they got horribly boring and people left. And she said, when you look at cities, this creative thing, I'm using my words, this whatever we want to call it, people think, people move around if they get priced out. And she said, I'm not that worried about New York, more worried about San Francisco or Vancouver, not that worried about New York because it's so big and there's so many of these kind of zones that, that things can pour into. But I think you're right. When I was writing Rise of the Creative Class, I was making an argument against convention center building, mega projects, high-end arts development I called the SOBs, the symphonies, the operas, and ballets that cities were spending hundreds of millions and billions on. And I said, what really activates neighborhoods is street-level culture, street-level arts. People want participative sports. They want a place to throw a Frisbee, take their dog for a walk, take their kid for a park. They want a place to go see a show that's cheap, that's inexpensive. They want it just in time because they're working crazy hours. Tom Frank, with whom I've debated 
many times, wrote a fantastic book, The Commodification of Cool. Uh, I think what's happened is that cool has been commodified and that developers are very smart and they realize that, that it's no longer just about building a fancy schmancy building. It's about building an activated neighborhood. And they don't really have the model for it because you can't do it de novo. But I think what, what happens if, you, if these pillars of creativity and arts are created, kind of value circulates around it. So, so yes, I think it is a part of the gentrification story. Uh, and, and cities, you know, this is why I'm, I'm not for tranching land use regulations and zoning. We kind of need a new set of land use regulations and zoning codes and building codes for the 21st century. I'm not sure what they are. But I think out of this debate and dialogue, we're getting there. But I do think, I do think that, that artists and creatives have, have been and are being, are being much more strategically used now to transform neighborhoods than ever before. And, you know, I've been talking to people who, who look at this. And what people seem to be saying is this p pattern of neighborhood transformation, which took decades. You know, you know, Ruth Glass wrote about gentrification in London when I was a six or seven year old boy, you know, in the 60s. Jane Jacobs wrote about New York City in the, in the 60s. It took 20 or 30 years. What people are saying, I, I've not looked at this, but are saying is happening in places like downtown Los Angeles, is accelerating that, you know, is, is making what took 20 years to happen in Soho is happening in a three to five year time scale. So that, that is in fact worrying. Yeah, we've seen that in, around downtown Brooklyn. Uh, and you know, from what I've read, San Francisco rapidly transformed. I, I know the, the machinery in New York better than anywhere else. Uh, and there's this conjunction of power, private real estate interests, working with city planning authorities, the Economic Development Corporation, elite nonprofits, all together. A lot of this is state-driven, policy-driven, but it never becomes a political issue. You can find out what's going on if you try, but it's obviously not there in the front pages of the newspapers. How do we get people to think and talk about this? The state is being used uh, in very specific ways in a very undemocratic and opaque ways, and how do we get this opened up? So I'm going to say two things on this. First of all, you, the first thing I agree with entirely, um, and I miss this myself, there was a great paper that I blogged about at, at City Lab, our website at The Atlantic, which talked about the use of what you call, they just talk public investment, but what you call state, state investment, massive investments in transit, investments in these things like the Brooklyn Navy Yard. We could go on. Charter schools. There's a whole range of them, from transit to transport to parks and open space, the High Line Park, actually a well-intentioned park by very progressive people that got turned into a real estate play. But, but the argument of this piece, which is so right on, is gentrification is not just the action of little creative class people looking for a cool place to live. It is partly, a large partly, the result of these massive it shifts in investment and real estate developers kind of pioneering and, and, and recreating neighborhoods. So you're absolutely right. On the second one, I think this is where I have consistently called for this. The creative class, this 33% of the workforce, 40% of the workforce in the San Francisco and New York metro, 80% of the workforce in lower Manhattan, I don't know what it is in your neighborhood of Brooklyn, but it's well over 50%. The creative class has to grow up and it has to become less inwardly focused, you know, to use the Marxian term, it has to become not just a class of itself, but a class for itself. It has to grow up and say, well, it's not just about my renovating my brownstone or fixing up my loft or buying my organic this or that, that there is a politics attached to this. Now, what gives me some hope, and, and again, you know, I, I'm not quite Walter Benjamin, you know, morose. Uh, in Europe, what gives me some hope, and, and many odd people would call me overly optimistic, is the fact that San Francisco and New York are still two of the most progressive places on the planet. They're not just creative class enclaves. They have a big working class. They have a big service class. There are racial politics. It's not, we no longer have the politics of advantage in the suburbs and the politics of disadvantage in the cities. The cities reflect a range of constituencies. And I think what's driving some of the progressive impulse in these cities is the creative class itself. The creative class is not voting for Trump. Who's voting for Trump? The working class. And here's where it gets quite controversial. I think the left needs to wake up a little here and say, you know, when we really look at the objective empirical data, the creative class is voting quite a bit more progressively. It is the class on the future-oriented side of history. The working class, tragically, is the class on the backward side of history, and parts of it are somewhat regressive. 
how can we fashion, and I think Sanders is a very good example of an attempt to do this, a creative class-led coalition, I call them a creative class socialist, gigglingly, I call them a creative class, so what else could he be coming from Burlington, uh, but trying to fuse that back to a progressive politics with the service class and bits of the working class. So I, I think it's time for the left to really start to organize, the, to get out of the categories that I grew up with, the 30s and the 50s and the 60s, and begin to think a bit about how the creative class in, compa in combination with other classes could be used as a progressive force. Because I really do think this is where the progressive element of our society is coming from, and, and somewhat unconsciously and in an unorganized fashion. I was Richard Florida, the urban theorist based at the University of Toronto. I'm skeptical that the creative class could ever become one for itself, or if it did, that its politics would be all that progressive, but these are topics for another interview. That's it for me, Doug Henwood. Let's go out with this, some of Stottkind, City Kid, by Ellen Aline. Berlin, you give me the strength. Till next week, bye.